Hi, environmental advocates. My name is Kyle Gatlin. I am the Partner Resource Manager with the Virginia Conservation Network, and welcome to General Assembly 101, a pre-recorded education event. As a quick note, um, in order to navigate this training, this training will be posted on VCN's General Assembly informational webpage. In order to navigate this training, there will be timestamps, hyperlinked timestamps, and descriptions of the individual uh, parts of this training. And you can utilize these hyperlinks in order to jump to the specific sections that you would like to learn from. Without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to Tim. Thank you, Kyle, and uh, thank you to everybody joining virtually. I imagine it's just thousands of people. I think it's just I'm speaking to an auditorium or of audiences right now. So thanks for joining, and mostly thank you for being part of whatever organization or civic group that you're a part of that's really finding the importance of uh, legislative advocacy uh, in the General Assembly session in Virginia. Um, want to make sure, Kyle, can you all see my screen? Yep. Great. And it's hopefully the, the one that's not my Google calendar. It's my, <laughs> it's the slide deck. Yeah, it's a slide deck. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Because I don't want to scare anybody. Um, everything that I have to deal with. So uh, go ahead and get started as a quick overview of uh, some context about what the General Assembly is and why it's important that you advocate, uh, advocate during that time. And in Brief description of it is that every General Assembly session is a chance to make people's lives better or worse. And depending on how much advocacy we put into it and how much work and how much noise we make and how much uh, we focus the issues so that they are equitable and beneficial to the public uh, is really going to determine the outcome. I have been involved in the legislative session uh, for almost nine years now. And I can tell you that if you might not feel like you're smart enough or you're passionate enough or powerful enough or rich enough to advocate in a way that makes a difference, then you're wrong. I've seen people come from different parts of Virginia at very different walks of life, very different backgrounds, very different identities, and they have made a difference. And so when they show up, when we do show up, things will be better. My theory in politics is the more people involved, the better it will get. Um, all right, so we'll just go ahead and jump in then. As soon as this starts working, there we go. So really quickly recap of what the General Assembly is and what it makes up and what makes up a bit. In short, the General Assembly is just Virginia's Congress. That's it. It makes laws, uh, votes on laws, evaluates laws, and um, but it's only specific to Virginia. Uh, it's made up of 100 members uh, in the in the lower chamber known as the House of Delegates. Virginia's a Commonwealth. Uh, if it wasn't a Commonwealth, it'd be called the House of Representatives, just like it is Congress. Um, but that's the deal. That's the only difference. Um, and then we have a Senate in the higher chamber, which is made up of 40 members. The current political calculus as it stands in terms of a party uh, is that there is 53 sitting Republicans and 48 Democrats, excuse me, 40, uh, 452, excuse me, 47 Democrats. Um, to realize there was a typo there, 47 Democrats in the, in the House of uh, Delegates. And in the Senate, we have 21 Democrats, um, 18 Republicans, and um, again, that's another thing. I should have looked this over beforehand. It's an old slide. Uh, there is a one point a majority lead in the Senate um, for Democrats. And the powers of all ge General Assembly members um, they can write and introduce bills, they get to vote on legislation, and they serve on committees. Quick overview of that. Uh, if you've watched Schoolhouse Rock, then you've seen this before, and there's a little bit of that's going to be echoed in this presentation. Um, now, it's really important to talk about the need for advocacy before we talk about how to do it. And, and really, what it boils down to is the matter of perspective, because perspective matters. Uh, as of right now, um, the demographics of the General Assembly is that there are 47 out of 140 uh, that identify as women, and then there is only 29 out of 140 that uh, are people of color. That's important because uh, lived experience goes a long way. There's an awful lot of behavioral science that shows when somebody has a lived experience and they run for office, that is, means that what they champion has a large part of doing uh, uh, based off what, what, they've, what they've lived through. And if they don't have that perspective, then they might not be as passionate about an issue or might not have a tangible understanding of an issue, but you may. And so if your perspective's not there, 
um, whether uh, by our actual elected officials or by a significant portion of our elected officials, your issue might not be as um, highlighted in the activity of the General Assembly. Uh, the next side of it is occupation. Again, that lived experience is really important. Your experience is going to have a great influence on how you understand issues, how you advocate on those issues, how hard you're going to advocate on those issues. Um, and experience can also come from occupation. And right now, the, about 50% or just a little bit more than 50% of our legislators represent the private sector. And there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with that, or lawyers, excuse me. There's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with that. But again, when we're talking about the greatest issues of our time, there's not a lot of scientists there. There's not a lot of healthcare professionals in there. Um, there's not a lot of nonprofit or community workers there. And there's not a lot of educators there. And we, if there was more time, we could talk about why those issues are so important and prevalent in Virginia and why we need more people advocating for those. Uh, but I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Um, uh, so again, perspective matters. And if they don't have the perspective naturally with themselves because of their occupation or their upbringing or their lives, uh, or their, their lived experience, then we have to bring them that perspective. Because if we don't, we won't necessarily have, uh, they won't necessarily be, that perspective won't be present in the proceedings that they do. Um, all right, and then last thing, when it comes to that perspective, and this is always some part that if people are paying very much attention to what I'm saying, it's there is a money in politics. And it's just something I'm going to acknowledge and talk about because I really think it underscores um, what, perspective is going to be influencing the General Assembly had there not, if there's not a great grassroots presence. Um, the reality of it is, is half of our, of our elected officials in the state legislature accept at least a third of their campaign contributions from the private sector and special interests. Um, this does not mean that they're always going to vote with the special interests that give them money 100% of the time. That doesn't mean that they're going to do whatever the corporation or special interest that um, it is pushing for and vote in favor of it 100% of the time. That's not what I'm saying. And I really can't make that clear because I've had people uh, who are elected officials get mad at me for not understanding what I'm saying. What I am saying, and what I think is important to say, is that when you give, when you have a relationship based off of money, you're going to answer the call. You're going to answer the phone. You're going to make space to hear what the what they're going to say. That's just a that is just a connection. That is a data point of a relationship. So we know that there's going to be special interests pushing for their for their um, issues, pushing for their legislation, and that's going to be heard by our elected officials. What we can't guarantee is that the uh, that the public and the private interests are going to be the same. So in order to make sure that there is a good contrast, a human contrast, a public contrast to these, we have to have grassroots advocates like you all pushing your perspective, pushing your issues in the halls of the General Assembly. And again, something that underscores all of this is that Dominion Energy, which is allowed to lobby in Virginia, even though they're a monopoly utility, and they're known for overcharging customers and have a whole bunch of um, other things that I think people can arguably take issue with, uh, they have are a top five donor, or excuse me, they're listed as the top five donor for both parties in the last election. That is a reality of our electoral system, that a monopoly utility like Dominion Energy can become one of the top donors for both political parties. And once again, I'm just saying that that means that their perspective is already going to exist in the General Assembly session, which is why we need to net, we have to be there to push back. All right, uh, that sounds kind of doom and gloomy. I don't want that to be the case. Um, that's why Kyle has gone screen to black because he's probably just upset about it. But Kyle, don't worry. There's hope and perspective about how what you can do to make sure that there's a there's a better presence uh, that more represents the reflections uh, that reflects the the public interest. Um, before we get into exactly how, we'll just go quickly to Schoolhouse Rock version of how a law how, of how an idea becomes a law. Um, first step. The, the GA member, the elected representative, they have an idea from a law. They don't always get the idea from themselves, by the way. Oftentimes they'll get it from advocacy organizations, or like I mentioned before, some special interests, or sometimes there's um, think tanks that try to say, hey, this is something that we're doing in other states, or this is something we have a good idea to pilot in Virginia. That happens all the time. They send the bill to the Department of Legislative Services, DLS will draft it to make sure that the, the, that the law is written in a way that um, fits what they call the Virginia Code. If you hear the word Virginia Code or the phrase Virginia Code, 
it just means Virginia law. It's just our state law. <clears throat> and then what happens is that legislator becomes what we call the chief patron. That's the person who is the most responsible for making sure that law gets passed. That bill is then sent to the committee. If it starts in the Senate, then it's going to be sent to a Senate committee. If it starts in the House, it's going to be sent to a House committee. You get it. Um, they hold public hearings on the committee deliberations. We're going to talk about why that's really important. Um, and then uh, the committee votes on whether or not the bill is going to get to the next stage, which would be an entire vote by one chamber. Um, so bill and a House committee get sent to the whole House floor. And then after, if it passes there, switches over to the Senate and vice versa. You get it. This is a very smart group. Um, every member has to vote on every bill that uh, every bill that passes, you know, um, uh, if they reach, reach a majority, it gets sent to the governor. And when Virginia were a little weird, because the, the governor can make like little changes to bills, that's not something that happens in a lot of other states, um, which they call line item veto. Um, or they can just say, Nope, this is a dumb bill, veto altogether. But then of course, the General Assembly has a chance to override that veto, but it takes a considerable amount of effort to do that. So that's the basic process. Uh, that is what you can look at from our process from an abstract academic level. What I want to talk about is how grassroots can be part of every single one of the steps of how you just as an individual can be part of every single one of these steps. So let's start with the first one. You can give an idea to a lawmaker. That is not out of the bounds. You don't have to be an expert on something. You don't have to have some important backing of some organization or some legitimate association or lobbying firm or whatever. You can just say, I don't want this. I, I have this idea. I think it's a public safety issue or a health issue or whatever. And you can just schedule a meeting with your legislator. That is what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to be servants of the people. So they're supposed to be, represent your interest. One of those things can be an idea for a law. Um, and then what you can do instead of saying, hey, you'll become the chief patron, you can, this is, becomes something called a bill by request. It happens in every General Assembly session. Every state legislative session, there's always a little mark and it says by request. And that means that the legislator is, is introducing a bill on behalf of somebody else. Um, and then, of course, if you're going to be doing that and going that route of writing your own bill, which you can also send to the Department of Legislative Services and they'll draft it for you. So if you have an idea, you don't have to have, have knowledge or have a legal degree in order to make it um, something that will fit into Virginia's code. That's what the Department of Legislative Services is for. And so Bill, you can have, here's a paragraph of what I want to do. Here's a couple of bullet points. It gets sent to the Department of Legislative Services, pops out as uh, a written document that could fit into Virginia's code. Um, then you're going to want to track that legislation. The Bill is sent to the committee. Committees are huge when it comes to grassroots efforts and lobbying um especially from uh public uh, the public or constituent lobbying or whatever you want to call it um bill sent to a certain committee um the house and senate work a little differently this way the speaker of the house gets to choose what committee it goes to so you have an important bill you're not sure where it's going to go you want it to go somewhere or if it's going to be sent somewhere at all which is another big power of the uh the speaker of the house um you can pressure the house speaker you know they're supposed to be representative of not just their constituency their district but of everyone, that's the position that they've been given. So pressuring them to send, to make sure that that committee gets sent or that bill gets sent to the right place is something that's absolutely within the wheelhouse uh, of, 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 you know, um, citizens to call for, um, to, to apply pressure. Um, when it's sent to a committee, it is up to the committee chair to review the bill. Sometimes committee chairmen can just say, hopefully, uh, well, it goes under the radar, but they'll just say, you know, what? I don't ever want to give this bill the, the time of day. I don't want us to actually vote on this or not vote on this. So again, kind of like when it comes to the Speaker of the House, there needs to apply some pressure on chairmen of a committee that a bill is sent to. And then after that, when they finally do review your bill, and you'll be able to do this in the tracking legislation part, you can show up to a committee and testify. You can be there. It doesn't matter if you are old enough to vote. It doesn't matter uh, where you come from. It doesn't matter if your representatives on that committee. Every single person is allowed to speak at a committee during a certain point. They have a uh, they have an issue. They have a part of the committee because it's a public hearing where they say, "Is there anyone in the audience who's in favor of this bill and would like to speak?" And go up. And they do the same thing with bills that we're against. Is there anyone who's against the bill who would like to speak? You can do that. You are allowed to do that. And that is one of the things that is really most that is really impactful in the general assembly session. 
All right. Um, this is just an example. Tethering laws are huge in Virginia for some reason. Um, this representative uh, did something by request. So that's from Virginia's legislative information system. It's like our it's one of the easiest ways to track legislation on that on that website. And you can just see by request. That just means that the legislator introduced it on someone else's behalf. OK, um, this is all pretty straightforward. And, you know, honestly, if you're following BCN or Sierra Club or any other organizations, um, we'll generally send you emails that says to call or email your representative. That's really important, especially when it's when it's going to an entire uh, floor. Here's why it's important uh, also to do that and why this shouldn't be overlooked. It's not just about like, you know, showing public demand. Oftentimes, the legislators aren't as familiar with a bill unless they're in the committee. And even then, sometimes they're not on top of it about the substance of a bill. Um, lobbying is oftentimes referred to as educating because we just want to make sure that there is uh, enough knowledge around the bill uh, that will get people um, that that that, that the, of the legislator to understand the bill because they don't want just to vote to make sure that they're supporting it but also if there's a debate on the house floor they have enough um, understanding of what the bill does to defend it and so calling or emailing your representative is not just showing public demand it's also saying hey pay attention to this one i know you have to review 3000 bills per session or 3000 bills go through session and it's hard for you to necessarily pinpoint one but when we show public demand that says Please pay attention to this one. Please make sure you are understanding the implications of this bill. And again, if you don't do that, it might just be overlooked. It might just die because no one ever told them to pay attention to it. That happens every session. It's unfortunate, but we have one of the shortest sessions in the country. And legislators, it's just not possible on a human capacity level to understand the substance of every single bill. Um, so that's both a disadvantage for democracy, I guess, but it's an advantage for public advocates to make sure that, you know, we, we, there's a bill that was really important to us, pay attention to it. Um, and then of course, goes to the next chamber, repeat the same thing uh, with the committees. And when it comes to the last step, you can always contact their governor's constituent services office. They have an issue. So again, driving up public demand, making some noise about it, making sure the governor understands that this is important to people. That's how you can get a bill across the finish line, just from a grassroots perspective. Um, when I talked about committees being the 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 one of the key battlegrounds for session, I, I really do mean that. That's when a lot of the action from a grassroots level takes place. And to understand committees is really, it's not as complicated as it might seem if you if you have kind of a thousand foot view of it. They're just gatekeepers. They just decide whether or not a bill gets to make it to the next stage. Um, they're designated by different topics. So the Education Committee is uh, uh, supposed to review legislation that does education uh, or has implications for education. Um, a lot of them, uh, if not all of them, have subcommittees. So if we're in the Education Committee, there's a committee on higher education. There's a committee on secondary education. Um, that's one of the things that will happen. So. The same committee tactics that I just talked about can also apply to subcommittees. Um, parliamentary procedure is somewhat confusing, but the biggest thing to understand is when there's an action taking place in a committee, all one committee member has to do is say, hey, I move. That's the magic word to say, I want to take an action. Um, and then any other committee member has to say, I second that move. That's how a, a vote on a bill comes to pass. And when it comes to the different actions of committees, there's a lot, but there's really only one that leads to success. And that magic word is report. If they report a bill, that means it goes to the full chamber to have to take for, for the entire chamber, every single member of that chamber to vote on. Every other thing is not necessarily a, uh, death sentence, but it doesn't necessarily um, make it's not successful um, in advocacy efforts. So the biggest one that's just a straight up we're killing this bill is passed by definitely. That means that they just said, no, we don't want to deal with this again. So it's dead. Um, you can pass by for the day, which means, you know, we'll we'll take this up with this. This bill is taking too much of our time. Let's take it up in the next committee hearing. Um, they can strike it. This is usually from the person who is the chief patron of a bill. That just means I don't want to just just take it for away. I don't I don't want to deal with this one anymore. Um, this one's important because this happens a lot, especially with our bigger bills, and it's called refer. 
that just sends a bill to a different committee. They can also do something, oftentimes in the Senate, they'll do this, we'll say, we report and refer. That just means like, we like this bill, but we want another committee to look at it. So a bigger bill that might have implications for climate or pollution um, will probably go to a commerce and labor committee, which deals with transactions and other things, and you know, because there's economic impacts necessarily. Um, and they'll say, well, we like this bill, but send it over to the agriculture committee too, because I think this has agricultural agriculture implications. And so you'll see this bill get referred to maybe three or four different committees beforehand. And it's exhausting to track these things. And it's exhausting to show up to every committee meeting, meeting but it is important that we do it. That's how um, uh, bills can have uh, a lot more success and a lot more odds of success is when there's a sustained presence around them. Uh, table, which we'll just lay on the table. That's just a nicer way to say we're killing this bill. That's almost always used to just kill it. Sometimes, in a very rare occasion, they can table something and then they can bring it back up later on and revive it, but that almost never happens. And then the last action that's really important to know, it's called incorporate. Uh, that means that that bill is so similar to another bill. Um, well, this is the idea around it. That's so similar to another bill that we're just going to add it into another bill. That effectively kills a bill because oftentimes they'll use incorporate to have a bill that has like similar language, but a completely different um, substance than another bill. And they'll just say, no, nah, let's kill it by incorporating into this bill. It's happened multiple occasions when we'll have bills that um, uh, are wildly different, but have the same topic. And they'll incorporate a bill into another piece of legislation that's almost antithetical to the original bill. That happens. So once again, uh, if you don't hear the word report, you don't read the word report when I'm talking about community act, uh, committee activity, it's not going to be, um, it's, it's, that means that the bill failed. It didn't succeed necessarily. Um, tracking legislation. This is also really important, especially if you're on a grassroots side. Um, the biggest one that most people use is called the Virginia Legislative Information System, commonly referred to as LIS. Um, I will show some slides about what that looks like. Um, and there's also if you, but it's not exact. It's not the most user friendly or easy to navigate. So a lot of people also use something called the Virginia Public Access Project. It's a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that does a lot with General Assembly uh, tracking, and you can search bills by topic um, in there. Um, and of course, when it comes to tracking legislation, uh, biggest thing is is you have to have a good method of doing it, understanding the the significance of what things are saying. Once again, you know, this system was built hundreds of years ago, so there's the language is kind of antiquated, which is why it's important to understand what different terminology means. So I'm not just being a definitions nerd. Uh, this actually has like really important implications for it. Um, so the method that you want to do is check the status of the bill, and that could be like, what stage is the bill in? Um, most of the times you might, well, you want to see what committee it's in and when that is up for a full, be for a full vote. Um, example time. This is the home page of the legislative information system, LIS. And uh, if you want to search bills at this point in time, uh, then just clicking on bills and resolutions just to see a full list of what's out there, seeing them by topic, seeing what their language they are, what the titles of them are. Um, that's how you do it. That's where you can go there. But if you're curious about what your elected representative has done, you can always look at General Assembly members. Um, if you're curious about what's going on in particular committees during session, clicking on standing committees and letting them know, then you can find bills from there. But let's just keep it simple for now and just click on bills and resolutions. Um, here you go. It's again kind of the same thing that I've I, I just talked about. When you click on this, you can you, you can do you can see them all, or you can just look at them by a particular subset. Um, if you know the bill number, it's great. That's the easiest way to track legislation from here. You'll see the the blue circle. You just do HB twenty forty six or whatever, or SB ten, and then you'll pick up uh, that. It'll show you directly the link of that legislation. And once you finally get to your legislation page. Then you can check the history. And this is where you check the status of the bill. So this is a bill we're really concerned about um, because it's a bad bill. It essentially would get rid of the clean car standards that Virginia has been a part of, um, which are really effective in making sure that people have a choice in purchasing an electric vehicle in Virginia as opposed to just a gas powered polluting vehicle. Um, and it also is really important to drive down pollution in our communities because transportation is one of the harshest 
and most immense sources of pollution in Virginia, both for our climate and for our communities when it comes to impacting health. So this is a bad bill and we're gonna have to be checking it. So once session starts, you go, you look at this bill and you look at history. So right now you see that it says committee referral per pending. If you want, uh, as session goes on, eventually that will say committee sent to committee X, um, commerce and labor, or, you know, uh, they really can send it to any committee, uh, which is ridiculous. Um, so we might might see the education committee. I don't think so, but that's not out of the realm of possibility. So this is really important when you're looking at something like this. Um, here you go. This is just another bill that we're following. This is um, this is trying to get rid of the Re regional greenhouse gas initiative. Another bad bill. Um, this was from last year, and so this is why I'm just showing you the full history of how you check it. So you can see every single step that this had to go through before before um, it finally got killed. What ended up happening was it was referred to the Committee on Commerce and Energy. Um, and uh, if you click on that, it'll show you the agenda. That's why it's uh, in blue. Um, if, as you can see there before, it was reported by a subcommittee um, by six yes, four no. If you click on that, you will be able to see who voted yes and who voted no. This is really important when it comes to holding people accountable. If you want to have your um, elected representative voted the wrong way, and you want, well, if you want to know if they voted the wrong way or the right way, this is where you do it. This is how you can find out if they are actually reflecting your interests or not. Um, same thing, as you can see, it just goes all the way down the line. We had to follow this all the way down. And then as, as we can see here, it was passed by definitely in a Senate committee. So that went through the house, got voted on by the whole chamber of the house, had to go all the way to a Senate committee before that bill died. That bill was never even sent to a full Senate uh, floor. So I was gonna say any questions, <laughs> but I guess, uh, you know, we don't have any right now, but if you wanna email me or something, great. Um, again, this is just, I just jumped the gun without, uh, I just talked about it without showing my fun animation. And again, this is just an example of uh, who voted what way in different uh, in different committees. So this is for the full committee. And you can see who exactly voted yes to report, which means because we don't like this bill, who voted yes to essentially repeal the regional greenhouse gas initiative. And the nays were, in our opinion, the good guys in this one. All right, really quickly on lobbying. This is another thing people overthink. They get nervous about going to see their elected officials. They think that there's gotta be something special about them. Um, and I maybe not be worthy to be in the same presence of them. Uh, that is a bunch of bull <laughs> on both sides. There are some really amazing people on, who are elected officials in our General Assembly who are whip smart and can like just you can ask them anything and they'll almost know anything about any policy. That is a rarity. The fact remains that these are just human beings that who, who are only in the legislative session 60 or 45 days of the year, two months and the majority. Thousands of bills go through their, the, that, the, the state legislature during that time. They're not going to be able to track every single one of them. They're not going to be able to understand every single one of them, like I said before. And so when you're lobbying, it's really important to just leave an impression. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be that smart. You don't have to be funny or rich or whatever to get their attention. Once you're in the room, whether it's with the legislator or the legislative themselves or legislative assistants, you just have to leave an impression. Make sure that they'll remember what you had why you were there. Um, <clears throat> the way to do that, the best way to do that is to explain why an issue is important to you. We can get into facts and figures. We can talk about studies till you know until our faces are blue. But in reality, these are human beings, and behavior science shows that what drives human decision making is not necessarily logic, it's emotion. And telling people why something is important to you, telling, it, telling them why it matters to you and yours or your community and why something might hurt you or help you, that is what leaves an impression. That is what gets people to make a, uh, to make a decision on a particular bill, especially if it's one that they don't understand, which happens a lot in, this, in the state legislative session. And the fact that you're there also, imagine that you are a constituent. And if you can demonstrate that you are tied to the community somehow, whether you're you know, a volunteer at a really important, you know, community organization, or you know the different landscapes and different areas or neighborhoods of different areas, showcasing how important you are as a constituent is really important. 
uh, this is crucial, bring a handout. The talks with your legislators shouldn't be scientifically focused, but leaving something behind that has the facts and figures that they can read over just to make sure that they have you know, the truth on their side, that's really important. That shouldn't be the focus of what you say. That shouldn't be the focus of what you're talking about. What you talk about should just be, this is important to me because my community is getting sick because of pollution. I am sick because of my pollution. Or my grandmother is sick because of pollution. That I, these are the stories that make a difference. Uh, the handout just says, we can drive down pollution by 25% or, or this will save people money by healthcare costs of billions of dollars as long as we stay in this policy. Um, but humanizing it by telling personal stories in particular, that's how you make a difference. And I've seen it where I've been with grassroots advocates, talk to a particular legislative official, and then later on, that elected official, while they were debating the merits of a bill on the floor of the Senate, retold their story, retold the story of the person who came into their office. And so this is what somebody just told me, and I, this is what the stakes are. It's about them and their livelihoods. And that's why we were sent here is to do something about that. That's leaving an impression. It did, that's the, and that's how you do it. That's what lobbying is for, especially on the grassroots level. It's not about convincing them about science or data or anything like that. It's about making sure that they know the stakes. Um, yeah, I already mentioned this. Don't be into celebrities. They're great, but they're not that special. Um, debating them has never been really that helpful. That actually is antithetical to our cause. It's always a friendly thing, especially if you're a constituent, just to be like, hey, I, we might not agree on everything, but I really think that this particular piece of legislation is really important, and here's why. Um, straying from the point, that happens sometimes too, and they'll do this thing where they ask you too many questions about like you and your life. It's like a sales tactic, and it's because they don't necessarily want to get into the substance of what you're what you're talking about, but still want to have safe face. Um, don't, you know, it's okay to exchange pleasantries, but don't get off topic. Don't allow them to hide, you know, to to, to veer you off course. Um, and I already talked about why it's important not to only bring up facts and figures. Any questions? Great, must be killing it because there's no questions yet. So a uh, really quick note on <laughs> engaging committees. Um, the advantages of them is that there is less members to convince at one time. Uh, so it's nice because instead of lobbying with one person at a time, there is a few, but it's not 140 or 100 or 40. A huge thing is um, the media is present. And that's just something I really wanted to, to mention. Because what will happen oftentimes is that there will be a bill and it can have great implications or bad implications for someone's life. And I'm specifically involved in PR at the Sierra Club. I go to committees and I, well, I watch them and, I, and as soon as the committee's over, I try to go up to a media person and say, hey, that was our bill. Do you want to talk about it a little bit? But what I know that they're looking for every single time is to see some kind of human impact or humanity of an issue. And if they can have someone who testifies to a committee and really pulls on the heartstrings, that will be their priority. That's what they'll do immediately. As what, excuse me, that's immediately what they will lock on to. So we had someone during the Medicaid expansion uh, fight, for example, um, which was just another policy in 2018 at that time, which could have expanded healthcare to 600,000 Virginians. It did pass, but at the point in time, the odds were against the people advocating for it. And there was a woman who got up there and said, my son is uh, in this Medicaid gap where he can't get health insurance, but he was born without the right valve of his heart and his medicine costs $500 a month and his twice yearly checkup costs $20,000 each one time without insurance. And so if we can't get Medicaid expansion, my husband and I who are ready to retire and we've worked hard all our lives, we'll essentially bankrupt ourselves because who wouldn't bankrupt themselves for their child? And the committee, uh, being the jerks that they were, uh, voted against that bill anyway. But you know what? It didn't matter because that woman's testimony ended up on the front page of the Richmond Times Dispatch the following morning. And every single one of them looked like jerks at that point. Um, and they know that. They know the stakes of like, they need to have a good face and good reputation. So the media is there is another advantage. Um, because if you can get people to pull on the heartstrings, I've seen it from both sides where we've had people come in and say, I don't do this bill because it's going to hurt my livelihood. And then they change their minds, even though they were going in ready to vote in favor or against a bill. But because there was a good presence about people talking about their livelihoods, 
they felt like they were hamstring to do it. And ultimately that woman's son did get health insurance and, and is, is perfectly fine. By the way, I followed up. Um, uh, when it comes to testifying, again, that's super easy. You don't usually have a lot of time to do it. They might give you two minutes. They might give you 30 seconds, but the basics are the same. Where are you from? Why are you there? Um, personal impacts and uh, like, a, like a quick story like I just demonstrated. And then you thank the chair and the committee. That's it. That's all it takes. It's 20 seconds out of your lives maybe, but it, it can really make a huge impact when it comes to the fate of a particular bill. Um, don't worry about that. That was just the video of the of the lady speaking. Um, that's pretty much all I have. Uh, I don't. This is just from our old one about. Uh, um, uh, or seems not our old one, but this is what the, the Sierra Club's really focused on right now. Um, looks like we're going to have a big fight ahead of us in terms of making sure that good policy remains the policy of the Commonwealth. Um, so, uh, any questions? No, great. I, uh, I'm so glad uh, that everyone got everything they needed out of this. And so I'm going to go ahead and throw it back to Kyle, uh, who, I don't know, Kyle, do you have any questions? Uh, I, what is your, what is your thoughts on um, potentially sending a, uh, a Christmas card or a holiday card or whatnot to your legislators? Do you think that that kind of small interaction is important or do you think more broad interaction like going to their office more important oh that's a great question and i would say all of the above right so okay. the best thing you can do is establish a relationship with your with your with your elected official and here's the deal you know because uh, we're about we're a couple of weeks from the or a week out from the election everyone's focused on campaigning right now um but I always like to say this is that civic engagement doesn't end with a ballot. It starts there. Um, you can forge the relationships with your elected officials at any point in time. Um, you can meet with their offices, even just to check in and say, Hey, this is just going things that I've seen and concerned with and have conversations, but they are people and they are people who have to have other people believe in them in order to keep their job. Um, so it's not, it shouldn't feel intimidating uh, to be able to reach out to your elected official. And that's honestly, which is great about that is once you have a relationship before session, everything I talked about was something you can do during session. But if you want to relate some groundwork before the for that, um, I've seen it where people are just, you know, perfectly, you know, seemingly average people who have a good relationship with the with their elected official, and then they walk to the General Assembly, and they cut the line, and they just go straight for the office, and they're welcomed in it. So what you're talking about, like a Christmas card, or again, you know, key to lobbying is leaving an impression. A Christmas card, a handwritten note, a nice email. Um, positive accountability doesn't get as much hype as yeah. negative accountability does, um, but it is still really important just to say, hey, I think you're doing a great job sometimes, or hey, you know, I'm just a constituent and I'm following what you do and I hope we can meet sometimes. That is really important. Um, we're coming up on session. So if you wanted to lay the groundwork of getting uh, established as a strong relationship right now, it's it's not as likely to be as fruitful, but there's never too early to start. I would just say it's got to be a consistent, yeah. you know, presence. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And yeah. uh, once again, thank you for educating us, uh, Tim. As always, it was amazing. Uh, next up, I'm going to pass it to Andrew, our Civic Engagement Outreach Manager here at VCN. Take what Andrew. So, hey, thank you all so much for watching this training on how the VCN advocacy process works. We're excited that you're here and we really appreciate that you're advocating uh, with us. Um, we know that without a strong grassroots presence, this work becomes infinitely more difficult. So again, thank you for showing up and doing your part. Uh, here in this portion of the training, I'm going to discuss with you how you can get involved with VCN's advocacy efforts. We have several ways for you to get and stay engaged with environmental advocacy across the board. So first, I want to highlight a few public events that VCN holds each year to help advance our common agenda. Our General Assembly preview is our last big event of the year is your chance to learn more about the big legislative issues that you can expect to arise during the upcoming General Assembly. We'll be live streaming our speakers to regions all across Virginia where regional leaders will be holding in person watch parties. You'll be able to hear from experts in the field and get a crash course on the specific environmental policies that will affect all Virginians. After these discussions, they'll have the opportunity to meet activists and local environmental leaders to talk about the issues that are expected to affect your specific community. Following these meetings, we will, 
what we really strongly encourage you all to do is to reach out to your local legislators and explain to them what you learned during the General Assembly preview. The single most important thing you can do as an environmental advocate is connect with your representatives and talk to them as often as possible. The more you're able to connect with your legislator and advocate for the issues of your choice, the more likely it is that they'll advocate on your behalf during the General Assembly when they convene in Richmond. Now, these conversations with the legislators are the perfect lead ups to our next big event, which is typically held in January, which is our annual Conservation Lobby Day. Lobby Day is an exciting day long groundswell of where our activists meet with their legislators in Richmond. Uh, hundreds of folks come to Richmond to meet with their uh, senators and, and House delegates members, uh, and it's the perfect opportunity to deepen their relationships with their legislators, their staff, and advocates in your community. We encourage that you register for this as early as you can. Uh, hundreds of people show up each year, and it's a, it's, you know, while it's a great opportunity to, to meet with others, uh, there is limited space, so we do encourage you to sign up early. Um, we also strongly, strongly encourage you to keep an eye out for other Lobby Day events happening during session. DCN's Lobby Day is just one of many um, Lobby Days that are hosted by partners in Virginia um, and keeping up that constant discussion and drumbeat of support for the issues that you care about is going to be so, so important. Uh, what you want to really walk away with from Lobby Day is having established these relationships with your legislators so they know who you are. Finally, I'd like to call to your attention to our VCN's advocacy resource page on our website. Just go to vcnva.org slash take dash action, where you'll be directed to a number of free resources that you can download and share with your own networks. Whether you're looking for lobbying tips, grassroots advocacy, advocacy tactics, or best practices when it comes to communications, you probably have what you're looking for. Again, thank you so much for your time and for your advocacy. Without this constant drumbeat of environmental support from our grassroots members, we risk the loss of all positive uh, conservation progress that we've made in Virginia so far. Remember, make sure to talk to your legislators as often as you can, organize your neighbors and community members, and stay connected with our BCN partner organizations to stay up to date on all environmental advocacy efforts happening in Virginia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. I will now pass it back to Kyle. Oh, thank you. That was awesome. Um, uh, so we are coming to the end of our training. I'd like to thank Tim again, and I'd like to thank Andrew again. Um, those are great. And if you have any more questions, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, if you have any more questions, um, you can reach out to them um, at their emails here. Um, and uh, ask your questions away. Uh, I'm going to go back a slide once and uh, reiterate about how you can navigate this uh, education, um, pre-recorded education um, uh, event. So once again, this training will be posted on VCN's General Assembly informational webpage. Um, navigating the page, you're going to find some hyperlinked timestamps as well as descriptions of uh, the individual sections that Tim went over, as well as the section that Andrew went over. Um, finally, you can utilize these timestamps and descriptions to find and jump to the specific education section that you would like to learn from. Uh, once again, if you have any more questions, please reach out to Tim or Andrew, uh, they're very nice people, um, very lovely, and they will answer your questions um, in an amazing fashion. Um, for more information uh, about the General Assembly, um, you can visit VCN's General Assembly informational page. Um, and for more information uh, about the Virginia Environmental Movement, uh, you can obviously uh, visit vcnva.org. Um, and for more information about Virginia's Sierra Club chapter, uh, you can go to the Sierra Club website and navigate through. Um, as a final um, note, if you have enjoyed this training or if you found this education um, event informative, uh, please consider a contribution um, or supporting us. For more information, please visit VCN's donation and gift page. Once again, if you enjoyed or found this uh, VCN education event informative, please consider a contribution. Uh, for more information, please visit VCN's donation and gift page. Um, thank you for uh, 
being with us today. Um, and we are excited to um, see you um, take action uh, in Virginia's environmental movement. Thank you very much. Have a good day.